the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that lets success so high. I will achieve. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Banking Show, where we bring you the story behind the major developments in the banking space. It is 13th of July, 2023. I am Ruchika Chitravanshi and let me start with what's in the lineup today. Our cover story will discuss the RBI's proposal to allow customers to choose their debit or credit card network. In Banker's View, we have with us this week, Govind Singh, MD and CEO of Utkarsh Small Finance Bank. In Banking For You, we will tell you what is the first loan default guarantee. Our consulting editor, Tamal Bandhupadhyay, will join us to discuss some interesting banking sector developments. At the show's end, we will share the results of last week's poll and the question for this week. The Reserve Bank of India recently directed card issuers, both banks and non-banks, to allow customers to choose any one among the multiple card networks such as Visa, MasterCard, American Express and Rupee. What are the implications of this move? Raghu Mohan explains in this report. The Reserve Bank of India has made a case for customers to choose the networks for debit, credit and prepaid cards. This challenges the current practice of banks deciding on the same. The RBI's draft circular invited comments on the following aspects. Card issuers shall not enter into any arrangement or agreement with card networks that restrain them from availing the services of other card networks that they shall issue cards across more than one card network and shall provide an option to their eligible customers to choose any one among the multiple card networks. This may be exercised by customers either at the time of issue or at any subsequent time. So, uh, you know, uh, let's break it up into multiple parts. First is from a consumer point of view. Now the consumer has an option. Uh, he can choose the network that he wants. Uh, earlier, uh, what used to happen is the bank used to thrust upon the consumer on the network, right? Now he can choose whether he wants Visa, whether he wants Master, whether he wants Rupee, whether he wants Amex, he can decide, right? Depending on what the network is offering to him. Uh, for example, today Rupee is offering uh, uh, lounge access to everyone, right? Which a lot of other networks don't offer. So from a consumer point of view, he has an option. Uh, from a uh, merchant point of view, if more and more rupee cards are uh, offered, then he gains from a MDR point of view. At this point in time, on rupee credit cards, uh, less than 2000, there is no MDR. More than 2000, it is 1.1, right? Which is far lower than what the other networks are offering. From other networks point of view, this is an option to, you know, uh, focus on getting more cards in. Currently, we have some 85 odd million credit cards in the country and around 600 odd million debit cards. So the gap is huge, right? Uh, the market is large enough. We are a credit hungry economy. Uh, if uh, the uh, networks end up, you know, reducing MDRs, more and more people and more and more merchants will prefer accepting cards as a way to uh, uh, accept payments, right? Uh, I think that will that will help. So it's it's a win-win from all points of view. The predatory pricing that most of the networks were going for will now stop. Meanwhile, credit card figures continue to hit new highs in India. In April 2023, the issued base stood at 86.5 million with spends at 1.32 trillion rupees. Yet it has one of the lowest credit card activation rates in the world. More than half the plastic is not activated by customers within the first three months of being in their wallets. And of the 86.5 million base, unique holders make up nearly 50 million. The number of debit cards issued in April stood at 967 million. Mint Road's move 
to pair rupee credit cards with the UPI last June has also led to wider card acceptance. Card usage at point of sale machines went up from around 8 million to nearly 50 million outlets, which ride on the UPI. The speculation is that over time, Visa, Mastercard, American Express, and diners may also be allowed a link up with UPI. That said, a report by digital lender Neo Insights says 70% of retailers believe that more than half of their sales will be via UPI. This was based on the lender's customer data of 3,000 retailers, along with a survey of 1,000 of them across 25 and 70 plus cities and segments. The period covered was October December of 2019, 2021, and 2022, the peak festive seasons on either side of the pandemic. Other than widening the options for customers, the central bank move may also set the stage for credit card network portability. Just like mobile number portability, customers may soon be able to use the same plastic across card networks. But it will depend on how credit card networks view their portability. It may come with conditions, say, that credit card dues to an issuer on a given network are settled before moving on. So more options for the customer, but some restrictions for those issuing these cards. Moving on, Govind Singh, MD and CEO of Utkarsh Small Finance Bank, spoke with Business Standards Manujit Saha on how their loan book has grown and its experience with non-payments during COVID and many more issues. Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Banking Show. Utkarsh, which was a microfinance institution, started to operate as a small finance bank in 2017. Headquartered in Varanasi, the bank has a strong presence in the rural and semi-urban areas with 830 branches. We today have Govind Singh, the Managing Director and CEO of Utkarsh Small Finance Bank, to talk about the journey so far. Mr. Singh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Manojit. As on March 31st, 2023, the loan book of the bank was close to 14,000 crore. Uh, how much was the growth in FY23 as compared to the previous year? So our loan growth in the 23 has been around 31% if you compare with the previous year. And, you know, uh, I'll use the word now we are almost outside, out of COVID. So we are seeing a normal growth uh, as far as, you know, uh, the loan book is concerned. And what kind of growth you have seen in the deposits? So deposit grew by around 36% the last financial year. And, uh, and I mean, we are seeing a good traction in deposits also. You know, uh, uh, during this period, we could open a lot of many new branches and we are seeing a you know, good traction in both sides, advance and deposits uh, because of the larger network now. Of the 14,000 crore loan book, what is the share of MFI loans in the total loan book? So MFI is close to 65% uh, in the overall uh, book of uh, ours, uh, very close to 9,000 crore in fact, I mean the rounded number. And uh, we are seeing that, you know, uh, in spite of being a bank, we are uh, seeing a good growth in, in microfinance space also. But if in terms of percentage, the others are taking over because they are the new businesses, then the percentage is higher than microfinance for sure. But going ahead, I'm sure you want to uh, reduce the balance sheet a bit more. So what is the ideal uh, combination you look in your loan book in terms of how much could be the MFI portfolio and how much could be the others? So I think it's a journey. Uh, so I, I may not have an exact number where we reach, uh, but if you see our track, you know, trajectory for last few years, uh, every year we are seeing an in increase in non-microfinance book by five six percent uh, because of the you can say low base. And uh, the way things are happening, I think it looks like that this same trajectory will will continue for some time. So certainly, you know, the share of microfinance will come down, and share of other uh, book will keep going up uh, from here. Uh, what has happened, Manojit, you know, during the last uh, six years of existence of bank, we have created new verticals like MSME, affordable housing, deals, uh, small corporates. And now they are seeing, you know, much better growth because initially, uh, initial two, three years, it takes to uh, set up things, put products in place, put technology in place. That has been done. So now we are seeing a good traction and, it, and it's, a, it's a regular traction now. It's a normal business uh, as usual for these other businesses also. Now, coming to the asset quality part, most of the small finance banks saw rising bad loans in FY23. 
uh, due to COVID related non payments. Uh, how have been the Utka Small Finance Bank experience? So we also had some challenges, but that was more in the year 21 and 22. Uh, you know, the, during this COVID period, especially because when you have microfinance type of businesses, me uh, reaching out to the customers, meeting those customers, and a lot of people also lost their livelihood during that period. So certainly, you know, the stress assets or overall NPA grew uh, during that period. But uh, if you see last on last year onwards, you know, uh, it's almost an almost a normal year. And there are some slip, you know, you can say spillover of previous year or slippages because of the still some some challenges of uh, COVID. But otherwise, it's almost a you know normal uh, portfolio right now. And we are seeing a significant decline in overall NPA and net NPA during the last year. And this trend looks like it will continue. And what kind of provision coverage ratio you had in the FY23? So we're very close to you know uh, very close to ninety percent of our provision coverage ratio. And we are a conservative bank that way. Uh, we keep, uh, you know, uh, we always keep high uh, provision because, you know, uh, it is better to uh, absorb the shocks as early as possible. So, uh, PCR will be one of the things which we always uh, ensure that we have a higher. And we have seen a growth in this, I mean, increase in the PCR so that uh, the net NP becomes very, very low. Also, the banks has reduced the issue size by about 63% and there was no offer for sale which would have reduced the promoter's stake. What was the re reason for reducing the size? So two things are there. Uh, see, our primary raise is, is very close to what we are supposed to do because we raised 150 crore last year also. So this, uh, you know, if you look at 500 crore now and 6, 150 crore, that's, that takes care of my primary requirement or my tier one requirement for sure. Uh, for secondary, you know, uh, the thought process because we have the long-term investors, uh, their idea was first we should list the bank, then see for some time, and then they see what are the processes through which they can, uh, you know, exit. Because we don't have any individual investors who are, who are looking for uh, can say secondary. It was the holding company uh, run by, you know, uh, led by various uh, various uh, investors. So they are not they are not keen right on secondary. They want to see first the performance of the bank and see how the you know, market looks at us. And then uh, look at the you know ways to exit from uh, from the bank or from the holding company. Now, Utkarsh is a very diversified, has a very diversified uh, shareholding pattern. But what is the promoter shareholding now and what would it be, would be post the IPO? So uh, we have a two-tier structure. We have a holding company, which is the promoter for the bank. So they currently hold around uh, 84% and post IPO, it will come below 73%, you know, uh, the overall dilution. Uh, but if you look at our even holding, the promoter of this uh, bank, that is uh, Utkar Score Invest Limited, even that is well diversified, uh, you know, the shareholding pattern. Uh, like people like CDC and Avishkar and RBL Bank, Fairing Capital. Uh, so it's a very well diversified book, uh, even the holding company part. Now, related to capital, uh, RPI has recently come out with a discussion paper on expected credit loss based loan loss provisioning. Uh, what could be the impact of the on the bank uh, after you transit, uh, transit to the ECL framework? And do you think uh, ECL norms could pose a challenge to smaller banks? So at least the type of you know activity we do, uh, uh, if you see especially those who are into unsecured lending or microfinance space, uh, they will have a they will uh, you know I'll use or provide early in fact than uh, those who are the secured businesses. Uh, that's one part. Second, we are anyway you know uh, we are making uh, NDS you know uh, on a regular basis, and we have not seen much impact of NDS uh, you know. And if you are, if you, I just mentioned we are taking additional provision in terms of floating provision also, so those all are helping us. So we don't foresee any significant uh, change. Sometimes it will be helpful also uh, because there are some positive things in that, you know, uh, in, in, even in the India's part. But we don't foresee any challenge uh, moving to India's whenever, you know, Reserve Bank of India decides to move on. Thank you so much, Mr. Singh. It was a pleasure uh, talking to you. Thank you for speaking to Business Standard. Same here. Thank you very much for this call and look forward to, you know, meeting you once again shortly. So as Govind Singh shared, the share of microfinance portfolio, which is now 65% of the loan book, will come down progressively as new verticals that the bank has created in the last six years are seeing good growth. Be it MSME, affordable housing, small corporates, etc. And now to our Banking for You segment. On June 8th, the RBI came out with a regulatory framework to permit default loan guarantee arrangements in digital lending. This was a major relief to fintech companies seeking clarity on their lending arrangements with banks and non-banking financial companies. Let us have a look at the policy in detail.
First Loan Default Guarantee or FLDG is an agreement between fintech players and banks or non-banking financial companies in which the fintech players guarantee to compensate for up to a certain percentage of default in a loan portfolio. In some cases, it used to go up to as high as 100%. Banks were keen on this model because fintech companies were sharing part of the risk and banks could expand their lending capacity. However, the Reserve Bank of India was not comfortable with the model as fintech companies are not regulated entities under the central bank. Hence, the RBI barred this arrangement under the digital lending norms. Earlier in June, the RBI introduced a regulatory framework to permit default loss guarantee arrangements in digital lending. Based on the new regulation, the default cover could be provided for up to 5% of the loan portfolio and shall be invoked within a maximum overdue period of 120 days. In addition to this, fintech players will have to submit a guarantee in the form of cash deposit, fixed deposit or bank guarantee in favour of the lender. Now, only an RBI-regulated entity is entitled to have an FLDG agreement with a lending service provider or other regulated entities. It indicates that a registered entity can accept FLDG in forms like cash deposited, fixed deposits maintained with a scheduled commercial bank with a lien marked in favour of the registered entity and bank guarantee in its favour. According to a Crystal report limiting FLDG to 5% of loan portfolio and not allowing corporate guarantees as a form of FLDG may dampen business volume in segments where FLDGs are currently higher than the permissible limit. On the other hand, industry experts highlight that 5% is less and a higher limit could help fintech companies and MSMEs to get access to credit. The new guidelines also disallowed non-cash forms of FLDG other than bank guarantees. Given that a reasonable proportion of FLDG is understood to be in the form of corporate guarantees, this could necessitate additional fundraising by the sourcing NBFCs involved. I am the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that lets success so high. I will achieve. I will fly high. I am the eye in SBI. I'm backed by the nation's trusted bank, SBI. I the banker. The to every Indian. This will reduce the risk for all the entities regulated by the RBI, especially if there is any slowdown in the funding of startups. In our expert take today, Tamal Bandhupadhyay talks about why it is time for the government, the majority owner in public sector banks, to end cash. He also talks about the internationalization of the rupee. Here's the chat. Hi, Tamar. Welcome to the Business Standard Banking Show. Uh, so we're starting our discussion by talking about something uh, you've uh, delved into in great detail in your column. Uh, we are seeing a drop in bad loans in public sector banks. There's a rise in profits. And you are saying that the public sector, the government should make hay while the sun shines. Why are you saying that? And uh, uh, how exactly do you mean? Well, you know that uh, if you see that um, I started my column saying that Bank of Baroda uh, market cap crossed one trillion. So, of course, it's it's only the second bank out of the twelve public sector banks. This is the second bank, and this is a uh, state bank of India is the first one, uh, much much bigger. So, bank stocks are shining. Uh, there's a bull run. Indices of bank stocks have done better than. Uh, uh, since six seven nifty in the past yes. over one year or so, and even within the banks, public sector banks have done better than the private banks. So, I mean, it's a the kind of bull run what we are seeing as far as the public sector bank stocks are concerned. Uh, it's something we have not seen before. So, isn't that time the government 
take this you know opportunity and grab it with both hands and try to make some money that's all i'm saying because what happens is this uh, i don't want to burden with you with numbers the, the since the 90s the trillions of rupees your money my money taxpayers money has got into the recapitalization of banks but has the government made any money out of it no i mean i i spoke about one economic survey which spoke about uh, analyzed uh, the how much money has gone into the uh, into the banking and public sector banks and the return is actually negative in the us what will happen that that scheme post lehman crisis that scheme uh, they put in money and they have made money they have made profit we have not done so this is the time probably time is right uh, the government should uh, um, go ahead and uh, use this opportunity to make uh, so are you suggesting that the government should uh, basically sell in the market uh, or how how will that play out exactly exactly i am not talking about private if you see uh, government stake uh, is many of the banks 90% some of them are 80% and on so no here close to 51% let the government uh, hold 51% plus i'm not talking about at all the uh, I, this is a privatization is a separate issue altogether but here you just use this opportunity to go to the market and sell all your stake sell your sell your shares uh, to others whatever money the government can make i think this is an opportunity uh, for the government to do that you saying that you're not talking about privatization and the banks can still hold 51% uh, government can still hold 51% but let's talk about privatization so what do you think uh, has happened there because uh, actually nothing has happened yeah it's uh, more than 2 years now the, the announcement done by the uh, finance minister in the budget but i think we are all waiting for it's a test case which idbi bank uh, no uh, it's a genuine privatization because when lic picked up a stake it's only it's a proxy for government now idbi um, we discussed before idbi now the technical bits are being evaluated and i would like to believe by december uh, idbi bank uh, will be closed the privatization and once that is done and 2024 the elections are there so whether the government will be encouraged immediately after the idbi privatization to get into bank privatization probably not keeping mind in the in the uh, general elections so probably we would like to we, we may see it post elections uh, one thing you asked you did not ask me but i'm just explaining that even though i'm not talking about privatization what i am saying is this, if you want to make you want to uh, run the engine as well as it is running government should follow a hands off policy at this point of time being a dominant shareholder government is also you know sub the banks are subject to dual regulation which is reserve bank of india and government as early as in 1991 early 90s the simon committee spoke about it so government should actually let the banks uh, run by their boards and two critical factors which can be done to um, to, to to run the banks on their own is let the board directors be appointed uh, not with the government interference and let the compensation be uh, decided by the board these two things act can change can can change the profile of public sector banks and for that you don't need any act amendment for that this bank so called bank nationalization act does not need to be amended just only one particular clause which is section 9 of the act just you do you amend that clause Let's move on to something that made a lot of news uh, recently, and that was uh, RBI talking about internationalization of rupee. Now, can you explain our viewers basically what it means and what do you think of it? What it means, you know that uh, rupee. I mean, all our trade uh, happens through rupee. Right now, we pay. We essentially we use dollar. uh like the the importers they need to pay in dollars or in in some cases maybe yen or pound sterling or euro but mostly in dollar even reserve bank of india's uh, total forex reserve you see the it's a it's a closely guarded secret people not talk about it but such but the bulk of it is is dollar um uh, us treasury bills and all. so this, that's a reserve currency now what we want is this uh, rupee being used for all these cross border transaction so it's good it's definitely good but it's a dream when will you realize it we do not know how many decades it will it will it will take we do not know because just one technical point i am telling you this report this report was submitted in october 2022 
and released in release now. Why did Reserve Bank of India take so long to release the report? So definitely, even the regulator is not in a hurry. It is. It's not a RBI report. It's a independent committee report, but it's released after six months, more than six months. So certainly there is no urgency on, on behalf of the central bank to do that. Even if you are looking for public comments, you should have done it in October itself. Why did you sit on it so long? And then, uh, I mean, you know, there are multiple, there are many, many issues. I don't want to get into the technicalities. Even in the government bond market, we are not in the global bond indices. And, uh, and the for, for, um, foreign investors, they can't buy just any bond. Uh, you know, there are restrictions. Yes, the restrictions are being waived for the new bonds, but the legacy bonds, they, are, they cannot touch it. Uh, RBI does intervention in the foreign exchange market. If the rupee goes, um, I mean, rupee is weakening, then RBI comes and sells dollars. If the rupee is strengthening, RBI comes and buys dollars. Now, uh, I mean, if, if you want rupee to be internationalized, a sort of reserve currency, can you afford to do that? Point taken, the mark. Turf is not right right now. There are a lot of roadblocks, so this may not be the right time. But it is the right time, as you said, to uh, for government to end cash uh, in public sector banks. So hopefully there are people uh, listening to you and will take some action. Uh, we will see you again next week. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So the internationalization of the rupee may have to wait, but Tamal made some important points about how the government can sell in the market and may be considering giving up some administrative control. And now to the poll results. Here's what we asked you last week. Is it the end of the road for Forex cards? 72% of our respondents fell yes, while 28% said no. June 30th was the last date for customers to renew their bank locker agreements. The changes come after a 2021 Supreme Court ruling clarifying the responsibilities and liabilities of banks and their locker users. The rules define what can and cannot be stored in lockers and customers would be held responsible for any violations. You cannot store cash, currency or hazardous substances or perishable items. So this week's poll would also be a status check on what has happened with this new agreement. Here's our poll question for this week. Have you signed the renewed bank locker agreement? Our poll is open from today, that is Thursday, and you can respond on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Telegram and our website. We will be back next week with more news and analysis. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn. I am the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that lets success so high. I will achieve. Trusted Bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian.